dia a todos. Não, isto não é uma sessão de stand-up comedy às 9 da manhã, às 10 da manhã. É sim um... Uh, o... Bem-vindos. Bem-vindos e bom regresso a muitas caras conhecidas, ex-alunos de NTC, que é de TIC também. A Cátia já está naquela. Eu não fiz NTC, eu estudei TIC. Sim, eu sei disso. Bem-vindos ao, ao Departamento de Comunicação e Artes. Para aqueles que nos visitam pela primeira vez, vocês estão no novo edifício, no, do DECA, o DECA 2, como alguns chamam. Quero dar as boas-vindas ao nosso convidado, que está a agradecer, mas vou passar em inglês para que ele consiga perceber aquilo que eu estou a dizer. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome to yet again another session that was organized by the Science and Technology area of the Department of Communication and Arts. I'd like to welcome our invited guest, so Professor much. Santos. And I would, of course, I'm, I'm not going to take too much time. I'm going to pass the mic over to Professor Farage that the, the majority, if not all of you, already know. And I wish you um, a great morning in terms of exchanging knowledge, exchanging experiences. I hope that some of you that have come back have the opportunity to network with the new students, with the, the staff here at the Department of Communication and Arts. And I hope this is the first of many comeback sessions. But uh, what about sound then? Oh, yeah. The whole thing about HDMI was sound. Oh, there it is. It's working. Yeah, but it's working from where? Oh, not from that. It's not working from here. Oh, it's working. It's working. It's working. Far away. <laughs> He's joining you. Yep, <laughs> always. <laughs> okay, so just to finalize, um, where is uh, Sandra? From? There she is. Oh, okay, she's there. So thank you very much to, to the American Corn and to the Department of Communication and Arts, to the uh, DG Media Research Unit, and to the Communication and Art Department on behalf of uh, Professor Rui Raposo. So Santos, the floor is yours. We are very excited to you. <laughs> I don't know, Ferraz or Jorge? Or George. <laughs> George is fine. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I have been knowing uh, Professor George and uh, Professor Pedro here for like 10 plus years. And it's been amazing uh, being on the circuit of uh, conferences. So I was telling them that like, uh, we were going around the campus and uh, Professor George was showing me like this is um, Cesar Vieira. So a uh, lot of buildings were uh, very resonating in their architecture, and I was really liking the campus a lot. So, And guess what? I have a lot of pictures of my campus on here to show you. So that became a very good segue for me to start the talk. <laughs> so um, my name is Santosh, and uh, you can uh, stop me wherever if you have a question, because if you uh, want to know the details of any project that I'm flying over, uh, it's OK to stop me, OK? Don't feel like you cannot. Um, what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, Institute of Design, the campus, uh, what kind of work we do, and then get into uh, a bit of uh, usability and uh, TV uh, experiences. And then transition slowly into user experiences. And uh, what I'm trying to say is as a call to action from all of us researchers and new students of how we need to go from just user experience into systems. So hopefully my uh, storyline will be very easy to follow with me. It is uh, usability of products and then user experiences to then systems thinking. So I'm trying to have a path of that kind in today's agenda. And then we can have uh, as many questions as you want to ask. So I'm from uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. It's one of the very old technical schools where we started uh, very long back, it has a graduate and undergraduate program in many, many disciplines. As you can see, they're very similar to your campus. And IIT Institute of Design is part of that uh, uh, technical uh, technological school. 
We were founded in 1937 as the new Bauhaus. And uh, Mahali, um, Mahali Naj has a lot of sayings. I'll use some of those there. But uh, Wies Van, uh, Van der Rohe uh, was the main architect of this uh, IIT Institute of Design School. It was called Crown Hall. If you visit Chicago, this is a must-see. Uh, you'll see that uh, the building is extremely different than anything you have seen before. So this is the model, and this is the real building. So it's very to the scale of actual model. And um, interestingly, there's no many pillars inside the building. It's as open as it looks. All the pillars are on the exterior, so it's a very nice building to hang out in. But that's uh, not it. Like uh, You guys have a uh, couple of different architects build the different uh, campus buildings. So we have also had a series of luck with uh, really great architects helping us out with the buildings. So this is our main uh, campus center. It's called McCormick Tribune Campus Center. It's um, built by actually a Pr Pritzker Prize laureate Kolhas. Uh, if you know uh, architecture, you'll appreciate uh, this building as well. And uh, Pedro was visiting us for his sabbatical last year, but he missed out on us moving into a new building. So this is the latest building we moved into this year. It's called Kaplan Institute for Innovation. And this is not a 3D rendering. This is a real picture. <laughs> and I have to start telling people that this is not a rendering. This is a real picture. So it's, it almost lit, looks like we live in like a glass house with a light inside on. <laughs> Um, this is also the real picture of the insides. So it's been built specifically to encourage multidisciplinarity and uh, collaboration across different uh, technological silos of different technical schools. So it's very uh, interesting architecture. And this is how campus looks on a very good day. <laughs> so. Um, We've had a lot of luck, and uh, especially uh, me uh, with the uh, starting off in uh, Motorola Research Labs and then moving into IIT. And now I've made a similar transition, uh, which is move on into systems thinking and business uh, processes. So I'm now uh, working in another building that is, again, more fancy than even the other ones. So you can call me a lucky dog, right? <laughs> so. Um, so when he showed me the campus, I was like, man, you guys have a really beautiful campus. And especially like the contrast between modern architecture and then the Portuguese touch to it. And then I come to the front of the building and there's a nice well. Like literally takes me to my childhood because I come from an area which is very near to Goa, which, is, which has a tremendous Portuguese influence. So a little about uh, me, uh, enough of the buildings, I guess. So um, I worked as a principal research scientist at Motorola Labs, and then uh, I moved into teaching. And uh, now I teach as well as I work as a director of research for business process design at uh, Rush University Medical Center. So you can call that I have a split personality disorder. So half of the time I'm doing research in interactive TV, media experiences, and half of the time I'm doing uh, stuff like healthcare systems. So a little about uh, some projects that I worked at Motorola that, so that I can have this narrative of going from product design into systems thinking. You'll see that um, I'll show you really old stuff so that we can then come to the latest uh, view of systems thinking. So I'm taking a step back into how I started doing these things. Because when I talked to him, he's like, yeah, keep it interesting. Show some examples. I was like, OK, I can do that. So some of the very first beginning projects that we were struggling with as a research lab in, like I think, 2003, 2004, was, OK, how do you do voice user interfaces? There was no iOS, so there was no Siri. So you're trying to invent Siri, and you have that mindset, right? You're like way ahead of the curve, and you're like, how the hell do I design voice user interfaces? Because I have nothing to copy from. So here's an example of that. Let's hope the video works. Let's see. Here is what very low fidelity user testing looks like. OK. 
Can you hear? <laughs> I hope you get the kicks the way I was getting them when I was making the slides. We had like 15 screens, and he's like, I want to go from first to the last. <laughs> All these 14, I don't need them. Can anybody guess what, what is the problem there? Yep, the phone was very small. We had like literally one, uh, four or five lines of text we could do. There's no imagery. Resolution was like 100th or 1,000th of the resolution of screen that we have now. You have to understand like it's like designing today for like text interfaces of the old times. And also all this ease of use literature, the usability, the user experience books that you guys are reading are all written in the last 10, 15 years. So this was the time when we were really struggling in the industry to try to make this easy to use or simple to use uh, happen. So in order to address those issues, we were trying to keep everything very sequential, like very simple user interfaces. You go from step one to two to three to four. So keeping those sequential always had that problem, right? Now, if you are using it for the first time, you would be really on the money, right? You would get the things done very smoothly because we laid it out that easily for you. But if you are an expert, you've been using the interface for a few times, then suddenly you're like, why are you making me take these 20 steps to get something done where I can? Because it's like, call Santosh Basapur. You're like, which Santosh Basapur? The mobile or the home? Because Santosh Basapur exists in two different instances, right? So we were like struggling with those kind of problems. But if you look at your Siri or your Android Google Assistant today, all those interfaces are gone because we now go with just one command, like call Santosh at home. And it, it does the trick. Because all that understanding that years of research has led has been codified into the iOS platform and the Android platform. And we now, as designers in today's world, reap the benefits of all that years of work of slow progress and a lot of prototyping failures. So this is a device when I first saw, I was like, are you crazy? How are people going to use this? It had no screen. Bluetooth had not been invented yet. This is like Bluetooth 0.05. So even Bluetooth 1.0 was not released yet. And the guy comes to me, takes to me in a room and says, here is some espresso beans dipped in dark chocolate. Let's sit and brainstorm how will people use this device. I'm like, that won't be possible. Because any kind of brainstorming will lead to ideas that are just about today's technology thinking with today's interaction design problems. So. We were like, what can we do? Let's try, let's try to do some low-level prototyping. Let's put people with this in a car. Let's put people with this under the Chicago's L train and see what they do with these devices. So one instance you're going to see is my, uh, we brought in a person. We put them, just to be safe, we took a Lexus car. We took out all the engine, everything. We put it on the floor of our lab. And we covered the inter uh, all the sides with uh, projectors, like big ones like these. And we gave like a 270 degree immersion so that they have a steering wheel, they have the gas pedals, but the engine and all is not there. So if they crash, they're not going to kill themselves and not sue us. So this is an example of that kind of experimentation at a very, very low fidelity prototyping. Call 
call anybody. <laughs> So you see what I'm saying? Like usability for us was this. It was like struggling with everyday technology so that the technology fit the everyday needs of people and not some outlandish, like an experience that nobody has ever thought of before. Because look at the experience of it. Extremely simple, right? You're in your car. Your attention is on driving. I want to be able to call my wife or my whoever I need to talk to without looking at the phone screen and getting distracted. So we're doing very, very simple, streamlined stuff so that we can actually bring to fruition some of these experiences. So our focus was razor sharp on getting amazing products out the door with ease of use. So the ease of use kept becoming the buzzword of the day. Sorry. I think the two mics are colliding. Sorry? I know. Today I'm technology hindered. We were talking about it, right? Like we, we have fixed usability issues of most things, except the projectors, the same that was 20 years ago. <laughs> so the other one we were trying to do was like, slowly we were progressing, right? My lab was progressing. We were trying to go into my, like our teams were all trying to go into the space of social TV. Like the first project I think I presented uh, when uh, George and uh, Pedro were in the audiences, I hope was, or at least I hope they were attending the conference, was, <laughs> was uh, iShare. It was a video telephony uh, solution because everything was on the phone. So we were one of the very, very beginning people with the crazy idea that why are TVs not talking to each other? Remember, this is the world before Skype existed. All we had was Yahoo Instant Messenger or AOL. AOL Instant Messenger. So AIM or Yahoo were the big deal of the day. And we're like, why does my TV doesn't have Yahoo? We're just sitting and like, getting frustrated with the concept of TVs should be social. We should be able to talk to each other, either through TV or something which is enabling that uh, social life around TV. So one of the initial solutions was, can we devise a solution which will have something that sits on top of our television set? Naturally, we were Motorola, right? We were very inspired by Star Wars. Right? So we were like, we had this um, box. Guess what? The TV didn't have a very thin bezel at the time. They used to have a big box, right? We had depth of at least a foot or more to work with when we were designing this. So we had this heavy thing. It would sit on top of the TV. It, has a, it had like array of microphones so that anybody in the room talks, you could, we could pinpoint focus on them. And the camera would hang a bit low onto the screen of the TV. So if you're looking at the TV, the other side of the video call will feel as if they're looking at you. So we had accounted for all those kind of usability experiences and enabled. And then came the part of testing it. Guess what? We were dreaming this device. This device didn't exist. So how do you test a device that doesn't exist? So we went to a local IKEA and bought furniture. <laughs> And we took two labs from our two conference rooms. We just took the furniture of the conference room and put it out in the corridor, put the IKEA furniture into those two conferences room, and we had our people come and sit and talk to each other through TV. And because this solution didn't exist, we put that kind of plastic model on the TV. We just handmade plastic model, which was painted black. <laughs> so it was total fake. And we physically ran wires from one room. So we put the camera in one room and the microphone in one room and ran the video of that into the other room physically while taping down the, like this. We used literally this kind of tape. <laughs> we used that kind of cable to put it from one room to the other and made people feel as if they had a new solution where TVs were talking to each other with full, like, nice resolution video calling. And it was a great success. People loved it because for the first time, they were like, I can see this new media space in my living room where my grandparents can see my kids and just enjoy seeing them grow up because now you have this high resolution video instead of just talking on the phone or using instant messengers, which were restricted by characters at the time. So suddenly, like all this kind of low fidelity work where we were cheating the audience, literally the audience felt it was real, but as a technologist, we knew that this doesn't exist yet was enabling us to experiment and enabling us to kind of move the envelope forward into thinking what is possible and what can be made out of these devices. But again, I want to point out,
we were not sophisticated enough the way we are today because at the time we were still thinking of a device that would like wow the user, that would keep the user in this amazing world of technological devices that Motorola can manufacture. And that led to a lot of patterns, right? So <clears throat> our perspective was very similar to what then eventually became like a standards organization's uh, definition of usability called the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the satisfaction with which a user can use a specific device in a specific context can be called as usability. Like if you can achieve that kind of high efficiency usage and satisfying usage to achieve the goal of the user in minimal steps needed, you can call that as usability. Then we started into the underlying texture of what is usability, right? We started saying, what are the characteristics? What can we help people measure usability on? So suddenly we started saying, OK, it's about learnability. Can the people learn the device? Can the people uh, use it efficiently without wasting time? Can the people have problems memorizing the commands or not memorizing the commands? So suddenly the characteristics started falling in place. And there was a push for this from all angles. So there was this um, movement from the consulting side, like there was the Jacob Nielsen's of the world. We had Don Norman. We had all these great authors, like at the time Patrick Jordan. So everybody was defining it from consulting side. From the industry side, we were doing all this low fidelity prototyping, all this kind of defining new experiences. And we were saying, here is how we can use all those definitions. And then slowly we came into now this very sophisticated world we live in today, right? Like we are now that literature of trying to even define what ease of use is has now been transformed into, oh, we have such a nice set of, this is a 2014 slide anyways, but still it is so relevant to us. It says, we now have sophisticated research techniques that can be divided into a nice uh, two by two quadrant saying, we can understand using attitudinal research techniques to understand what people are saying all the way up to behavioral research of what people are actually doing. Because saying and doing can be sometimes very different. So we, want, we have started acknowledging that. And on the other spectrum, we started saying, we can qualitatively figure out why people are doing and quantitatively figure out how many times they're doing it or with what frequency or what are they exactly doing. So kind of deep diving into the data. And we started like, putting all kinds of methodologies to it. So it's become much, much more easier for us now, after all that years of experimentation, to say that, hey, by looking at these two slides, depending on what kind of research I want to do, I can easily toggle between like what kind of research I want to do, lay it out on the map, and then figure out which are the, some of the best methods I can use and go at it, right? So I hope like it, it becomes much more easier for you. Like I, I wish we had tools like this when we were struggling in those espresso beans dipped in dark chocolate sessions to figure out what's the best way to do this next step? What's the best way to experiment with it? What is the best way to figure out, will a user ever use something like this? Especially if the feature that we are trying to test is just unimaginable in the current technological context. Furthermore, because you are a very young audience here, so I put this slide last minute, you now have even much more sophisticated techniques of prototyping. You don't have to steal conference rooms and their equipment to do any kind of testing anymore. Because if you, the, this is a link. I definitely want you guys to try the link out when you have some time to explore this. You can take a picture of it, or I can give the slides to George, and he can upload it someplace we can access. But this interface completely allows you to choose things on the left side, and it dynamically updates that entire graph on the right side. And by choosing your expediency or ease of use or how easily can you export the prototype, the tools just fall into the right place, and you know which tool to use for what purpose. So all that thinking, that decades of research, has become crystallized. It's been almost like to the level that it's ready to use the way you want it. And then we started formalizing things, right? So this is the latest standard for human-centered design by International Standards Organization. So they are now saying that as long as you can understand the context 
and derive the needs of the user from there and specify those needs as the organizational uh, product requirement, you can then design those solutions. And then evaluate those. If it signs off on the quality that you want, it ships. If not, you enter iterative loop number two. So all that kind of process that I'm trying to, I was trying to learn has now become very crystallized. What happens though when something crystallizes this way? The good part is I can teach easily. Bad part is it makes me a cynic as well because I want to experiment even more, right? So my split personality comes into picture again. Because I started seeing this happen again. So Dilbert came to my rescue and said, Sintosh, you need to use me as a quote here. So when something becomes too easy, that also has a risk of its own. So we started seeing that complex systems started being thought of, but the theory side was not catching up in the academia yet. So then what happens when theory on the academia side doesn't catch up? The industry people start abusing those terms and conditions and methodologies. They started saying, here is a complex device, here is the solution, let's add ease of use to its list of requirements. So anything supremely complicated yet had to be one click away. And we're like, one click doesn't make it easy to use. But the managers were like, yes, it will be easy to use. So you started having this fight of what is ease of use again? So like 20 years of work, and you're back to the square one again saying, OK, how can we now improve the methodologies here? So that's when you saw like all this research happening across the globe, like, the, uh, like Mark Hazenzal in the Europe, Jody Forlizzi in the US at CMU, uh, Institute of Design professors Vijay Kumar and uh, Keiichi Sato. Across the world, they started saying, we need new terminology. Ease of use or usability is not enough for us to move this ball forward into the new realm of experiences. So we started getting these definitions of how user experience is a little bit more than usability, right? It's about encompass encompassing all aspects of user interaction with device. There was actually a good workshop a few years ago on what is user experience. Because every time I talk about it, all the students raise their hands and say, OK, what is usability and what is user experience? How do you distinguish them? So usability is usually about achieving the goal in the efficient way without errors and without much frustration. Whereas user experience, on the other hand, is the overall feeling the interaction leaves you with once you have done the interaction. So usability can be about the safety belt, what is the height of the drop of your roller coaster? How do you feel at that instance? All those interactions are usability. What do you think is the user experience of this then? Anybody wants to venture a guess? The whole emotional aspect of it, the whole journey aspect of it, all that gets into the because if I start calling just the maximum drop of the roller coaster as the best part of the experience, then I'm losing out ability to design the rest of it. So we started using models like journey maps. We were like, OK, there is more to it than just the usability and interaction with the device or the car of the roller coaster. It's about how does Santosh convince his friends to go with him to the park? Because the experience starts right there, right? I have to post on to Facebook saying, Anybody up for visiting Six Flags this weekend? Anybody up for going to Disneyland this summer? Imagine designing from that point onwards the journey to Disneyland. And they do do it, actually. That's why uh, this example works very well for me, at least, because they do entirely the whole process of uh, experience with Disney. So then comes the point of online purchase of the tickets, the planning. Then comes the riding the crowded bus from the parking lot to the front door of the Disney. Then comes the ride from front door of the Disney into the actual Disneyland. So there's like two separate bus rides just to get to the ride. Then comes the horrible part of waiting in front of the ride. So nobody thought of that in usability, right? We were always thinking of designing interactions with the device. Nobody thought of what Santosh and his family with two small kids will do when they wait for the ride to show up. Because hungry kids waiting for a parking in a hot parking lot at Florida 
is not something you want to deal with when on a vacation. See, only half the room laughed at me because the other half has not seen the kids yet. <laughs> so we started realizing that usability and interaction between one product and one user is not good enough, right? We need to start thinking about what happens when people start anticipating a UX? What happens when people start indulging and interacting with the service system? What happens after they're done with the interactions? Do I upload my pictures after this talk? Tells me how I extend my interaction with you guys. Because that's a second life of itself on the virtual media. Because I'll have interactions about you and me with my friends in the US, with my friends in India, with my friends across Europe, so that there's a different existence of media around this media that we are creating right now. So all that becomes experience. But over time, it will be, again, a memory, right? A nice memory that I can reflect upon and enjoy. So it becomes, again, even more relived experience. So there's always like an afterlife for media that we forget to design for. So same thing happened with us. We are like, OK, what about TV? We have TV experiences, but there should be more to TV than just watching TV. There should be more to TV than just social TV, or there should be more to TV than just like sitting together with others and watching TV. Where are, where are we not extending the life of TV media into the future? So we started struggling with this thing called, how can we enhance TV watching with other media around it? Again, I'll harp about the same problem now. We still were on Razer phones, so there was no iPhone when we were doing this. There was no tablet when we were doing this. Second screen was actually the second screen of laptop. And here we are sitting and trying to invent what can we do to enhance TV watching. OK, so that always will be the theme of this talk. So we did what researchers do best. We're like, let's go to the homes of Chicago people. We visited 36 homes and watched them watch TV. That was the best part of my life. I would go into people's homes and watch TV with them. <laughs> If they order pizza, I get a slice. <laughs> so we started immersing ourselves into that situation. We're like, we, we, uh, so if, if somebody's looking for the technical parlance, it's yes, it is ethnographic studies. But within ethnographic studies, what we were really trying to do is called cultural domain analysis. We forgot that we are TV watchers. We forced ourselves to say, go with fresh eyes into people's homes today at the time today, but and try to understand what are they doing with their TV? What are they watching it with? What are they doing before, during, or after TV watching? How are they describing TV? What is their language around TV in that time and day? We started seeing patterns emerge, right? We're trying to see, wow, they don't call it interactive TV. <laughs> it was our term in the technology industry, which we're trying to invent it. They were just talking about it as, Sometimes I'm immersed in the media. I love watching TV and just getting lost in the media of TV. And other times, I'm engaging with the media. Engaging meant engaged with the media, like watching TV, like say a Second World War documentary, and now getting deeper into it. Or it could be like I'm watching it, but on my laptop, I'm also Googling stuff. Because Google had come up very well at that time. So we were seeing people trying to complement their main TV watching with Googling stuff. And Googling had become a verb at that time. So we started seeing things like, in my engagement, I'm looking up information. I'm watching TV. It's a distributed thing. My big TV, that was the other language that started coming up. My big TV is in my basement. My small TV is in my kitchen. So we started seeing that this has become a distributed experience and not just this one big TV in my um, family room. So then we were like, OK, there is something to this. So let's start thinking. And at the same time, we had also started experimenting with parallel media to television. We were saying, what else can be done here? We were looking at this thing called Parallel Feeds. Parallel Feeds was a website. I have to say that first. You could log on to Parallel Feeds as at the same time which the TV will start. And then you're, that way you're synced physically. And then your parallel feed of information for the TV show that you're watching starts. So if you're watching American Idol, 
If the singer starts coming on to the stage, the singer's profile will come up. If the singer's song is announced, the song details will come up or the lyrics will come up. So we started synchronizing things across a laptop and a TV. Again, it was a completely made up protocol because there was no such website. There was a website. There was no backend or middleware that connected anything to anything. We were telling the user, when you turn your TV on, go to this website. And when you start the media there, click play on this website. So the only way it was in sync was with the user's uh, participation. But it was a tremendous experiment. When we launched it into 32 households in Chicago area, people were super impressed because we were a team of five people. So each person took like three or four shows each. And we enabled this experience for a limited handful of shows. Like the show would air one day, overnight, my team and I would create parallel feeds of information. And the next morning, we would allow the user to start using it. So everything was happening overnight. Like the, the whole onus of creating the secondary media was on us uh, overnight. And then that would then be consumed by the user in parallel. So you can see on the right side, this was our first draft of our interface. Nothing fancy, no graphics, because the website would be too slow if we put too many pictures. So it was very much time synchronized feed that you can scroll up and down, and you could watch it in parallel with the TV show. So I think it says Big Bang Theory, and it was like Freud and everything complex. So they loved it with shows like that, which had complex materials. So some of the few successes was live shows like American Idol, technically con complex shows like this one, and then new shows like John Stewart's Daily Show. So those kind of shows started making connection with us. But the other shows which were extremely melodramatic and TV series, we completely failed. But this kind of fidelity prototyping for user experiences had to be done, low fidelity, I mean, in order to even anticipate what will click and what will not click. But it became such a good hit that immediately we came under pressure. Because now that you're uh, enabling it for a few number of shows, how do you make it sustainable? So then our, suddenly the next challenge was, can we make others to do the work for us? So suddenly, fan feeds came into existence. So now, this became a real experimental service, because we had a middleware working. We had the entire social network working behind this. But now, what could happen is you're watching their TV show, and you log on to the website. As soon as you synchronize it, your friends' material starts coming to your second screen. So you're watching your show with your friends while they are commenting and you are responding. And if you happen to watch the show without them, you could still follow, and their interactions were from yesterday or day before would still come in. So there was this whole concept of real time and time shifted social life around media. But you're right. It started getting a little tedious and boring at that point. We're like, OK, what's going on here? We are really missing the forest for the trees. We are still trying to go. We made a move from product to user experiences, like second, experience, second screen experiences and media experiences that extend the TV. But still, we were lost in one media, one experience. We're saying there has to be a move that is bigger and better than just these individual experiences. So we started reflecting upon that and saying, what will happen if all these services we are thinking about come together? Because we started projecting to the future. So suddenly, I moved into systems thinking. We're like, there has to be a distributed media experience system. There has to be some operating system for a TV that brings all these different media together. So we started calling it as very bad names, like home TV or my TV or my channel. But eventually, it became uh, called as uh, set box media OS. So it became Medios. If you, if you guys do social uh, interactive TV experimentation, you might have seen a little bit of that. So we started getting into space like mixed media. What happens if I'm going across devices and I drop and dra pick up experiences from one to the other? So I'm reading a Harry Potter book. I stop at chapter three. I turn my video on. <clears throat> so the movie starts from that chapter three. I drop that, and I go to my Kindle. Wherever I stop my movie, my reading of the digital book starts from that experience. So we started weaving together experiences across devices and across contexts. So eventually, it became called as 
something fancy by the marketing people. So all that years of work slowly started merging and becoming a service, which we can now call it like, OK, we are thinking at a level of services. <clears throat> so then what's the big deal? right? We're like, OK, that makes sense as a product company now moving into services. But where is all that literature? So then we started, like, because I had now shifted slowly into uh, teaching as well, I started seeing that the language of the people is also changing. It's no more a product, it's a product system. It's no more just a service, it's a service system. So people in the li literature had also slowly started shifting towards what we call as systems thinking. They were slowly saying, oh, it's not just a product by itself. It lives in a distributed system of complementary products, complementary services that go as a package deal. And they were like, through final reflection and first usage to help service maintenance, we can now call this as service system thinking. So, we were really getting into that space of trying to see what's next. <clears throat> and there's a lot of philosophical context. I, I used to read a lot of uh, books at the time, and then I so came across this one uh, saying by Nelson Mandela said, after climbing a small hill is only when I realize that there are other hills I need to climb. So there's always that next hill that we need to climb. Till then, you feel like you're doing the best thing you can and climbing the nearest big hill that you saw. But only crossing that, you feel like, oh, no, I, I still have a long way to go. So, and he was talking about it in terms of freedom. So I was like, this is so appropriate with products-oriented thinking. You think you are on to the next big thing. You think you have the best pattern that will lead to years of income. But you're still way away from realizing that that was just one product. You have to be on a long trip with long, many more experiences in the uh, picture. So we're saying that uh, there's a lot of need for theoretical ground to catch up. We were going from usability into user experiences. We were going from user experiences into service design. But it only truly hit me when I started reading much more into systems and design of systems, especially design of complicated systems. So then we are like, that makes more sense now. Because we are not into products. We are not just enabling amazing experiences and not just doing media services. We need to be thinking, what is this whole big system that we can design? which will be much more um, in line with the people's needs and very inherent needs, so keep it more human-centered. So that's when we started looking for new systems design. And so my new work is uh, I muse in this uh, semiotics-based thinking of systems, which is what is the meaning of the system? What are the philosophies or principles that guide the system? And then if we can think of those, then we can think of designing a system that actually meets the uh, actual inherent like self-actualization need of the people. And what is new is always old, right? I did that, and the more I read, I realized that the founding member of my own Institute of Design had already said this in 1937. I'm like, duh. <laughs> because he had said, like, design is all about relationships. It's, it's not just about the product. He's like, design is an attitude. It's not just work. You got to think of the product in terms of its relationships. And he literally said, um, it's a harmonious balance of all elements necessary for a function. 
you can't just think of a product, but you have to think of what the product is doing for the user and bring it in a harmonious way into their life so that it doesn't upset the apple cart, but does surprise the user. So it's not like just keep inventing the stuff that they love. So I was like, okay, that, that makes more sense. So we started, uh, now, uh, current work now is we are trying to work with uh, human-centered system integration so that we are trying to integrate these social technological systems that try to maximize the impact on the user. Uh, it could be any, any domain of uh, research. I'm trying it into media experiences as well as in healthcare so that they're two separate domains, but they are coming, basically they're two different case studies for trying to see if this methodology works. Because the latest thing is all about ecosystem plays, right? We are not into the siloed worlds anymore, but siloed, but in a big major way now. So if you think of all the Apple devices and the experiences they bring together, you'll see what I'm talking about, right? This is the billions of dollars in the ecosystem of Apple. So we are not just into this media or one device or one experience. We are into this ecosystem plays now that are catering to a much, much, much broader experience systems that we have ever thought of. If you compare Apple to Android, you'll see like humongous dollar amounts there, but also humongous ability to create experiences that have not been thought of before at a scale that has not been thought of before. So we are now slowly moving into this big ecosystem place where our next big invention cannot just be a device or a user experience it literally has to be a platform that upsets the older platform. So think of how to beat Android and iOS at this point, not how to beat an iPhone, not how to beat an iPad. Are you with me? So we're inventing the next big thing. <laughs> so we are at that junction in life some, through some research or through technological advances where we are saying we are now the field of innovating with platforms that can disrupt existing players and that can enable new players. At this point, I would say the enablers, the Netflix and all should be at the bottom, and the upside of that should be empty, because that is what you will fill in, right? It's that, that's the goal of this talk. And I do realize that there are challenges here. I do realize that we need to be thinking of like, okay, how might we do this? What are the methods for this? What does now usability in this new world mean? I'm with you in the fight. We need to figure it out together. I don't have any ready big solutions, but we are, we are working towards it. So one thing I can definitely say is we need this methodology, whatever it is, to be multi-viewpoint oriented. It has to be able to account for the different things in the ecosystem, like who are the innovators, who are the distributors of media, who are the theoreticians or researchers in the area, who will be the content producer, who will be the consumer of what kind, we don't know. So our area of concern is known, but who are the different players we don't know, so we keep digging into different models that enable us to enrich that understanding. We also try to enrich our understanding by modeling it into different ways. If we think of different layers of interaction, what that interaction means, or why is that person in, in engaging in those interactions, suddenly we might have a different model of what people are doing and why they're doing it. So we are into, again, a phase that we were in early 2000 or late 90s. We don't know anything about usability at that. We didn't know anything about usability at that time. Now we are again in the area where we have some systems design processes, but again, we are at a loss of good sound methods. It's not as easy that I can pull a Dilbert on you yet. I wish I want to. So we are at this phase where we are saying, okay, what can design bring to the table? What is desirable by the people? What can society bring to the table? Like what is sustainability or what can be sustainable experience over time. What does business bring to the table? Right? What is a viable business? And last but not the least is, what can technology bring to the table? So that how can we invent this next new thing that we don't know yet about? So it's about like going back to the basics and starting to construct this knowledge again. So it's almost like knowledge creation and technology creation are like these endless loops. And hopefully they're upwardly mobile, so that we're inventing a new thing and learning new stuff every time we do this. There are some methodologies. There is this new book. Like, a lot of books are coming out that we would uh, base our thinking on. So this is 101 Design Methods book, uh, written by my colleague at uh, IIT Institute of Design, Vijay Kumar. So he, he talks about how we can go from knowing intent, step number one, 
all the way to step number seven, which is realizing that intent in some kind of a prototype. So he is trying to start writing about what can innovation be and how can we enable it with a seven step process. So a lot of research and a lot of methods are being written about. So stay tuned to that kind of systems thinking and systems design methods. So I would say like as a call to arms for us is it, it's on us. Like what does system usability mean and how can we define it? Uh, what is this whole multi channel universe coming down to and becoming your hyper personalized my channel? How will this integration of media look like? What is the role of uh, artificial intelligence in this? You may data mine to nth degree and say that Santosh loves comedy, but if Santosh is in mood for an action movie, then all the data mining is to waste. So how do we bridge those gaps between what AI can do and what people actually do in life? So we have to start thinking of all those bridges that we can, we can cross. So I'll leave you with this last video, which is um, how we were thinking at the time I uh, stopped uh, working in uh, applied research labs and moved into academia. So this is the one of the last videos I produced. Oops. No idea why it's not working. Oops. Murphy strikes at the end again. Is it working? Maybe I'll have to. Hopefully this will work. So I'll end my talk with this small last video. By the year 2020, the amount of video being consumed will fill 3 billion DVDs every day. How will people manage? Having, you know, some way to, to maybe create your own databases of, of what you like and what you want to see and, and, um, and having those things kind of read and analyzed to suggest more and, and really working together like that would be fantastic. It's going to become more and more interactive. It's going to become more and more sort of aware of who you are, what you're doing, what your likes and dislikes are. Because there's no doubt when I do searches, there's a consistency to what's of interest to me. I just don't want to see stuff that I'm You encounter video everywhere you go. How do you collect everything that's relevant to you? A video catches your eye. You collect it, saving it for later. The sand is recognized and associated with the desert. And because your interests include botany and warm weather travel, a video on desert landscapes is added to your collection. The videos you've encountered are at your fingertips, ready to enjoy and share. From the botanical gardens you passed, and your community. out to find things that will grab us. You've chosen it, it's chosen you. Content meets context. You have a lot to offer, so do your friends. How do we share what matters when it matters? It's a really cool way to kind of unite a, a community with, with video, which I think is awesome. It's kind of the point, you know, to bring people together. And, and maybe more importantly, be more intuitive to the, to the user. And you can share it instantaneously. When that happens, when you find a video and you want to share it and you just can't find it again because you don't remember what it was called. So, so now what we do is take this impulse that's already there. We're not inventing 
something. We're just making it easier. So sharing is not just about sort of sharing a song and emailing it to your friend. It's your birthday, and video of all the big moments in your life are easily accessible and instantly shareable. Everyone's sharing memories. So you see how Skype exists, but not to the level we would like it to be integrated in the everyday life. I think there's one last scenario and that's it. It's refusing to move my slide forward. Okay. So you see how we are like still like way far away from this vision. We we are still into the mindset of user experiences. We need to now step up and become more into service experiences that we can keep them as seamless as possible. There'll be a lot of complex technology. There'll be a lot of role for AI, VR, AR, but it will all be subdued under our everyday life. So thank you so much. George, for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing talk, I must say. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Uh, I don't know who wants to be the first. I can start to make you a question. We always have the academy on the side and the industry on the other side. So mm -hmm. how far do you think the industry is aware for the importance of the usability, user experience, and thinking um, the, the services as a whole uh, in, in the actual days? So 
like being a guy who was in the industry and then having jumped to the academic side, I'm going to say that they're always going to be rushing to their own ends. Mm -hmm. And we need to figure out how to bridge those two ends. So for instance, when I was in industry, we would always run for the next big thing technology wise. So it was more tech centered approach. So we need to start making them more human focused. On the academic side, we're always like theory focused, like what is the next thing that can explain everything that I know so far? So even that then becomes more like researcher focused and not actually human focused. So we really need to start bringing human-centered design home by making both technologies and researchers focus as people, uh, their life and how to enrich the life of people and not try to, it's not about invention of theory, neither is it about invention of just technology. Thank you very much. More questions? Question. Hi. <laughs> no, I'm... It's not for you, it's for the technology. <laughs> I guess so. All for the people. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It was indeed a, a brilliant talk. So thank, thank you, you again. You're kind. Um, I have kind of a provocative question, uh -huh, and uh, I was wondering, how do you design for an experience where technology does not overwhelm the user? Because mm -hmm. I understand from your point of view and from where you come, um, it's all about technology and integrating exactly. everything into a system. But I think we're reaching a point where there's too much technology, too, mu too much to choose from, too much where you, we can demand from. So how do we design for an experience which will not overwhelm the user? Perfect. So that's where you'll see like the commentary in the video was also about how sharing is not about just sending a music file or sharing and watching the TV together. It's about how can it be all encompassing and intuitive and more in line with the people's everyday life than something that calls itself uh, attention. Like it shouldn't be the focus. So we don't know exactly how, but we are trying. And that's why I showed that last model of uh, uh, four square model, which talks about knowing the intent and then realizing the prototype. We are trying to do approaches like tinkering. Tinkering is tinkering while you think with the people. So. It was just an acronym we made up at Institute of Design saying, how can we bring more people into the process of design so that we can be much more in tune with how they are thinking about it? And the lesson we learned was we cannot follow their advice on how to design because they are users and not designers. But we can also not forget that we are designers and not users. So getting them early into the cycle is the only way I've seen work out. And the reason I say that is very interesting is because in my half of personality, I do work in media experiences where it's much more easier to define what is a media because people are very self-aware of how they deal with things, uh, especially media things. So they do a great job at that. When it comes to healthcare, they are not as verbose or not as eloquent about what they need. So there it becomes even more challenging than what you're saying. That's why healthcare technology is always extremely overwhelming to people. I would say not as much in media because they master it very quickly, but new technologies coming up in healthcare experiences and all these serious experiences are really going to be the problem. Yeah, I, I guess so that's a great question. If there's no right answer to it. gigantic at the moment it's very big. because we are reaching a point where technology is actually able to to act naturally and intuitively and we need to decide when when the when the intervention makes sense because for example you know mm -hmm. that that uh, your weight is going down mm -hmm. or and you're reaching the the right level but do you still need to ask people to keep their agency, do you still need to ask them, do you want to eat that apple absolutely. instead of that cake? So we need to still make them feel oh, like absolutely. humans. Absolutely, I'm totally, yeah. it's such a great question. Yeah. It's, so. it's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing yeah, thank struggle. you so much. Actually, one uh, like a funny example I'll give you is from my recent work in automotive, uh, automated cars. We were doing this uh, workshop on interaction design for uh, self-driven cars. And my students were like, what can I do for it? Uh, 
Can the car go by itself to a car wash? Can the car go by itself to get itself service? So those are the pain points. I was like, talk to some families and see what they say. And guess what? When they did some interviews and came back to me and they were like, sometimes they don't care about servicing. It, it still happens. It's not a big deal. And they still go to car washes. And actually, car wash is more fun for the kids. So if the car goes and washes itself and comes back, my kids lose the fun. <laughs> and I was like, there you go. You got your answer, right? Like one of the immediate use cases we think of automation and stuff is that we try to take care of things for people. but. Guess what? Like most of the times, people can take care of things of that kind because they have an element of fun attached to it. So when, uh, when asked what is the problem the automated car should uh, solve, maybe you'll appreciate this. The, stu the students told me, like, all the parents said, solve the problem of are we there yet? <laughs> I hope people understood the joke. Because kids harassing the parents of are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? From the back seat, is much more of a problem than driving the car. <laughs> I would rather drive the car and not listen to that, right? <laughs> so the, the human need is always going to be the one that actually paramount to in, in inventing any new technology. So I totally appreciate what you're saying. OK, thank you. I have another question here. Yeah, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, yeah. We were kind of talking in back <laughs> channel, uh, and it seems like the technology side has been pushing uh, and is in a higher level of development of this mixed service experience yes. than the content side yes. of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we we saw the the example that you that you showed us with the chapters mm -hmm. that you begin in the television, go to Kindle, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know many contents that are adapt to that um, to that to that experience that is shared between uh, several different services? So no, those middlewares and backends don't exist yet. Uh, the only thing that I'm aware of is called WhisperSync, which is a uh, WhisperSync is Amazon technology on Kindle uh, that allows you to uh, sync up audiobooks and uh, actual textbook on the digital platform. So that is the only place where I've seen it come to fruition. The, the, In terms of, of the development of contents, the, the content producers are developing for this kind of experience? No, no. We will have to force them. Yeah. The experience with the movie where it's the father and the kid and yeah. they are watching the movie. And we have yep. seen that for 20 years <laughs> because we can have all these layers of information. But people want to experience the movie. So when you put a cut, it's like playing a game and you have a video clip and you don't yep. want to watch the video clip, you want to keep playing. So here it's a bit the same. You want to keep watching the movie, not... So that's why you saw the dad and the son pull for the control, exactly. right? Exactly. So th that's exactly the point. Those are the human issues, right? Who will control the media and in what way? But who said that media has only one life? The way I'm thinking about it is, like, media has multiple lives, right? For the first time, it could be very, very immersive. Do not touch the remote, right? I'm watching it. Like, I'm, I'm going to watch it. No, no disturbing me and my immersive experience. But the sex uh, sorry, next time around, yeah. I can look up a little bit. Yeah. Third time around, my kid can disturb me. I'm fine. Fourth time around, I can watch with friends. <laughs> Fifth time around, it could be playing in the party in the background, and nobody cares about it. <laughs> so media will always have multiple lives, and even social life around media will have multiple versions. So it's not one and done. And I hope like, that is the attitude we take to this work. It's never one and done. We have to keep iterating upon it. Thank, thank you. you. More questions, Fiona? The tough one from Pedro. <laughs> no, thank you, Santos. Great talk. Um, going going <laughs> through your narrative, we we, we, we came from uh, usability, was centered yeah, on very the product. product. Then we bring the users and we get all the experience and we had to look to several more issues. Uh -huh. And now I have uh, uh, system thinking where I have to think of a big ecosystem that connects mm -hmm. different technologies. Yep. My question is, isn't this innovation becoming too hard and only uh, available for big companies that are able to manage these big ecosystems? Like, it, is it so a, a game a for, for Google, for Amazon, for, I don't know, Netflix and uh, uh, Apple? Uh, and So yes and no. So unfortunately, to invest at that level into a platform, you have to be a big player. So 
yes, in order to compete with Google, you've got to be Amazon. In order to compete with Amazon, you've got to be a Facebook. But on the other hand, there's no stopping from companies becoming big, right? Netflix was nothing, but it became a big player right uh, after uh, Comcast allowed it to stream unlimited on their bandwidth. So yes and no. So you have to be a big player to invest big, but it doesn't stop small players from becoming big because the platform now being stable allows new kind of thinking. Without that kind of platform, you could not disrupt it and think fresh, right? Nobody thought that Airbnb could be a hoteling business with no hotels to its name. Only the platform existed that they could think of it that way and make it happen. Like Uber is the biggest taxi company with no taxis. So that, that kind of platforming will happen. But now that Uber became that platform, people started thinking Uber Eats, Uber this, Uber that, right? So again, so there will always be a place for big player to play a big game, but a small player to start new and grow fast. So it's always going to be a mix of those both. It's never going to be one or the other. And especially if we succeed and we make sure that net neutrality stays, that will be a big player in uh, encouraging small players to disrupt the big business. If that doesn't stay, then, then we need political change to enable us that. So there's always going to be social and political context to technology, which is what you're bringing attention to about small and big players. So see how quickly we went from product to big discussion yeah. like so it's all political ecosystem influence based. on net neutrality. That's the case I'm making. It's all ecosystem based. It could be it for a specific uh, yep. need or something. Exactly. I was uh, listening the other day a podcast of the Sonos CEO, you know, Sonos, the, the audio making company. Okay. And uh, they are now, well, they have all those uh, uh, voice interaction on those speakers and so on. And of course, with all these speakers, home assistants coming on. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there a place for you on the market? And uh, what well, the guy was saying, there's... Uh, so think of Sonos, right? Like Sonos, they brought one player. Yeah. Then they said, you can have multiple speakers that will work in sync. Copied immediately by Apple. Yeah. HomePod does exactly that. But still, HomePod is not beating Sonos. Yeah. Because Sonos has achieved the excellence that the HomePod is not achieving. So that is an a great the example full of how experience that exactly it brings to because the they thought of bringing distributed media and distributed rooms to come alive faster than Apple could, and they have the market and the brand identity in people's minds as a good service. So they are succeeding despite Apple being the competitor. Yeah. That's a great example, actually, to answer your previous question. So we always need some solid steps to go. Exactly, you got to be sure of what need and what basic life you're trying to enhance and enrich. Okay, thank you. So we have time for some more questions. No, nope, I was very clear, I guess. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> Sorry for all the technical issues. And definitely, I needed to thank Altus Labs and uh, American Corners because I completely didn't do that. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me here for that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Muito obrigado a todos vocês que também estiveram aqui. Eu espero que tenha sido útil uh, para vocês. Mais uma vez um agradecimento muito especial aqui ao Departamento de Comunicação e Arte, ao American Corner, à Altice Labs. O, esta, esta comemoração póstuma do Dia Mundial da Usabilidade continua hoje com uma aula aberta dada pela Inês, integrada no mestrado de comunicação Uh, de, 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 de multimédia. Uh, vamos ter também na altura é no auditório da reitoria, porque temos muitas pessoas, felizmente, uh, às duas horas. Depois vai haver um chill out na Altice, uh, também em torno desta temática da usabilidade e da user experience. E amanhã uma tiny talk uh, com o Santos e com o Bernardo Cardoso, responsável pela área de IPTV do MEO aqui na Altice Labs, moderada pela Silvia Fernandes. Portanto, também será uma experiência interessante. A Tiny Talk é na biblioteca e será divulgada também pelo YouTube, está bem? Toda a informação está no YouTube. Muito obrigado mais uma vez a todos. Thank you very much. Thank you.